Hello, we're so glad that you're joining us for another Keep Michigan Learning webinar hosted by Michigan Virtual. I'm Dr. Chris Harrington, and in today's session, we're joined by three experts here at Michigan Virtual. And during this conversation, we'll discuss some key considerations and strategies related to teaching in virtual or online learning environments. Before we jump into our topic for today, I wanna to be sure that you know that we have a series of recorded webinars on learning continuity available on the Michigan Virtual website. They're all freely available, so please visit the webpage listed on the bottom of the screen. It's michiganvirtual.org slash learning dash continuity and explore some other topics re related to remote teaching and learning. We have an amazing team joining this conversation today, so let's meet them. So we have Ann Perez, who's the Senior Professional Learning Specialist at Michigan Virtual, and she's previously taught high school level. We also have Andrea McKay, who's the Administrator of Instructional Leadership. And Andrea previously taught high school and also supports teachers who teach fully online courses. And we have Emily Cecilia, and Emily, Emily previously taught at the elementary level all our Michigan Virtual employees. And I'm Dr. Chris Harrington. I'm the director of Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute. Okay, so let's jump right in. Emily, could you please start us off with a conversation by guiding us on how to think about getting started with a transition to teaching online at the elementary level? I'd be happy to. When I think about this transition and I think about my, my kids and my families, I really want to focus on what is already familiar to them, right? We are going to a very unfamiliar setting. So if we can keep any type of semblance of normal, it'll be really important. So I've used um, Seesaw with my kids as a platform. And so they're already familiar with it. And my parents are familiar with it because they use it as a communication tool as well. Um, so that's probably the mode I would use. I would also though communicate via email because parents tend to check email more regularly than they would the Seesaw app. But um, you know, I might direct them to the email and then say, you know, if you can have your kids do X, Y, and Z. Um, along with that, I would, you know, really encourage to keep things simple. We did some pretty, um, pretty cool things with Seesaw in the classroom when I was there to support them that probably isn't possible at home when I'm not there to give direct instruction. There are ways to, to embed videos and voice in, in Seesaw, but it gets a little bit tricky when I'm not there to go through and show it to them. So really keeping things simple. If they've done tasks already that are familiar, maybe think about having them do those same tasks, but changing content. So if they're reading um, words, you know, if they're used to doing that, just change up the words or, or recording themselves doing something. Um, we've also talked to another school who, who don't, they don't use any platforms. They're a, a K through five school. And so again, going back to what's familiar and they're used to communicating with their parents via email. So maybe they wanna send out a list and say, okay, on Monday, if you can have your kids do X, Y, and Z, if you have any online work, here are some links, but really sticking with what's familiar and simplistic, I think is are two of the, the big keys of when you're thinking about this big transition. I know there's, it looks a little bit different in the, uh, in the secondary setting. So I'll let Andrea and, and Anne kind of talk about what it looks like there. Sure, I think um, another important consideration to think about as you move from face-to-face -to, -face to teaching more remote is the amount of time that you, your students will be spending on um, tasks. If you've ever taken an online class before, you know that there is just a lot of reading, a lot of writing, a lot of processing. So as you take your kids, whether they're elementary kids or high school kids, you really want to be mindful of the time that you're asking them to spend on um, coursework. So, uh, you know, if you typically spend uh, an hour in your face-to-face -face class with your students, you can't just put that whole hour online for them now to, to work through. You really have to give about half the time for them um, because you don't, you don't, nobody wants a student to spend six hours of their day in an online setting um, learning you know, through the computer. So think about shortening assignments as much as possible, um, making that time a lot less for students than you typically would face-to-face. 
Excellent, thank you so much. So when we look at this, um, to summarize a little bit, some of these considerations that I heard you say was stick with what's familiar. Don't try to do crazy things, all different kinds of things that are very unfamiliar to your kids. And simple is best. Um, it, it, it can be a, quite an adjustment, a transition for kids and for teachers alike, shifting to an online environment. So keep it simple, be successful. And um, account for half the time, just because some things will take longer, especially as we um, start that shift and, and as everyone becomes comfortable with this learning format. Thank you. Okay, great. So it's good to have that kind of framing when, we just, when we're just starting out teaching in this way. One particular aspect of teaching in a remote or online learning environment that feels very different from a face-to-face -face setting is communication. So Andrea, um, what do you feel teachers need to know about communicating in this type of environment? Thanks, Chris. I think there's a few things to really consider and pay attention to here when you're talking about moving to the remote learning environment. So if you're out of school because of an emergency, whether that's weather related or um, illness related, any type of emergency, you really want to think about what you've already been using, like Emily said in, in the previous um, slides. So think about what you already do to communicate with your students uh, in the face-to-face -face class and then how that might transition to more of a, a remote um, setting. So there's a couple of things I think you need to, to consider. Um, one is to really be clear and be aware of what your district's expectations are for communicating and updating students and families. Um, for your students, you might be using an LMS platform already. It might be, you know, Google Classroom or um, like Seesaw at some of the younger uh, levels. So that might be a way that you can already um, share updates and share announcements, or it might be through email with your parents and with your students as well. Um, but it's important to think about the frequency and the volume of communication you send. I have two students and they are both high schoolers. So um, they each take six classes a day. And if I'm getting in a daily email or even a weekly email from their teachers, that's 12 teachers. And that's a lot for me as a parent to keep track of. So be really considerate about what your district expects. And if there is more of a central hub that you can use to communicate through um, that might be best. Maybe share like a weekly checklist for parents so they know what's coming and what's going on versus daily communications or um, something like that that's a little bit too much. I think it's also important to be really consistent about where families can access those communications. This is probably not the time to start something totally new um, stick with that familiar and, and use that to your advantage. Uh, it's important so that everyone knows where to go to find the information. Um, so you're not being directed to 12 different you know, platforms or classrooms. It's also really important to think about you know, how you're communicating, whether that be um, what the purpose is for the communications. If you're communicating with your class in your face-to-face -face room, you usually might start with, you know, welcoming kids at the door and getting them going and sharing some whole class announcements. You can do that still online. You can provide um, an announcement in a Google Classroom that might be a slide that explains to kids what's coming and, and what to do there. You can also um, make quick little videos that you might post so they can see you and hear you and they can go back through that, that video at their own leisure when there's time. If you're communicating personally one-on-one -on -one with students, again, you can still do that in the online setting. You can use tools like um, Google Hangouts or Google Meet. You can use um, Zoom. A lot, of, a lot of people are trying out Zoom now too. So there's a lot of opportunity for personal and individualized communication. Um, and you can still take advantage of that in an online or remote setting. And you also want to think about, you know, building that class community and there's communication tools you can do for that too. Um, you can send out reminds to your class so that they are thinking still about the work that needs to be done and their relationships with you as the teacher. Um, you can create discussion platforms to have wonderful communication and, and have students ask questions to each other and to you. Um, there's still a lot of opportunity as far as communicating goes with students. 
one thing I think is really important to keep in mind when communicating is your tone and the tone of your communications, because it's really easy to send um, messages and the person who receives the message, uh, maybe they had a really bad day or you know, maybe they're a high schooler with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder or you know, something's going wrong for them. So if, you're, if your tone and your communication is not positive and professional, it could be easily misread. So be really mindful of um, keeping it positive in, in your written communication so that it's, it's taken as intended for all parties. I don't know if um, Emily or Anne have anything to add from a younger uh, perspective, a younger classroom perspective. I, I can say just from my two young sons and um, talking about communication, you know, they're, they're used to being with their teachers in this elementary setting for six hours a day and seeing them and being with them for six hours a day. And they miss that, that, that connection. And so anytime one of their teachers posts a video and it doesn't have to be academic related, it's like, here's my cat. They come running and they just love it. And so sharing that kind of personal part of you, because as you know, um, in the elementary experience, your kids think you live at school. And so to see you outside of the school setting just blows their mind and they eat it up. So thinking about really communicating with our little people, um, using videos and voice. And like Andrea said, keeping an upbeat tone. This is a scary time for everybody and, and they're gonna look to you for reassurance. And so I think that's really important. Um, elementary doesn't struggle with so much the, the number of teachers like you do in the secondary level. So, um, you know, communicating with parents on some of, of a regular basis, maybe not daily because we don't want to overwhelm them either, but maybe just a, a weekly check, you know, like a, an email and say, this is what we have. We did this week and this is what we're looking forward to next week. Maybe like a newsletter that you already did. Again, going back to stick with the familiar, if you can do a, if you can do a, um, keep that going, then I would, I would highly recommend you keep status quo as much as possible. Um, I think, I think that's all I have. I don't know, Anne, if, if you had anything to, to add to that. Um, I only, I think the only thing that I might uh, somewhat reiterate as I think they've all been highlighted and especially for the secondary level is just, um, kind of using the, the transition um, as you begin your online learning to um, outlining your clear expectations for your students, like the best ways that they can communicate with you or how to reach you um, when they have questions on assignments. Now that they're out of the classroom, you know, normally they're raising their hand or maybe going right up to your desk. But in this case, and I know with my high schooler, uh, sometimes they'll come to me and, and ask me questions. Uh, sh should, I, should I email or should I do this? And, and so I think taking the time to kind of outline um, if you would like your students to email you questions or to use the platform or to have a separate thread for certain questions or things like that, um, just kind of outlining um, a new online classroom culture and how those things will work will definitely help set the students up for success and kind of create that normalcy that you would if it was the first day of school in the face-to-face -face classroom. I have one more thing I wanted to add because I know a lot of teachers are being so brave and doing um, like, like Andrea was saying, like Zoom meetings with the whole class. And I just want a word of caution. I think that's fantastic. Uh, it might be a little overwhelming for you as the teacher if you have all of your 28 or 30 kiddos all in the same uh, Zoom meeting together or Google Hangout. So if you want to go that, which I would totally encourage you to do, think about maybe small group options um, and do maybe groups of four or five. And then you can have some, some rich experiences because as you know, it's like herding cats and that doesn't change online either. So um, I would I would caution you if you're going to do that, which I very much encourage you to do because the kids love it. Um, do it in a small group first, rather than maybe the whole group and sending out maybe expectations ahead of time, such as not wearing your pajamas or making sure everybody is is muted when they join, um, and making sure everybody is clothed in your whole household. So um, all things to consider with your little people, but probably your big people too. <laughs> that is so great. Thank you very much. Um, so, so one of the things, if I can kind of pull us together and, and, 
and summarize a little bit. Um, what, what I'm hearing is try to keep this as, as normal as possible for kids because this is a stressful time for everybody involved, right? Um, making a, like a rapid shift to teaching online. Um, so try to keep things as familiar as possible, as structured and as routine as you can, uh, but recognizing the fact that communicating in an online environment is very different than face-to-face. -face. So when we think about um, the messaging or the, the communications that you're going to have, Understanding what platform and what tools you have at your disposal are important, uh, but then also creating some consistency. And I would say from teacher to teacher and classroom to classroom, um, you know, whether you whether you're in the elementary or the secondary levels, um, having that consistency helps students tremendously. Um, but then also finding that balance between um, the frequency of conversations or communications and also um, the, the the messages that go out. So you want it to be frequent enough. But at the same time, you don't want to be overwhelming somebody's inbox or, or, or just overwhelming people in general uh, with too many communications. Make sure they're purposeful and, and meaningful, right? Thank you so much. That's, that's great. That's great information right there. Okay, so clearly um, communication is really important. It also looks differently in, a, in an online or a remote teaching environment. But let's shift the conversation a little bit. Let's talk about content. So Anne, could you share some thoughts with us about how to present or deliver content to students when a teacher is just starting out teaching in a remote learning environment? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, one of the first things I think that uh, teachers should consider right now is what, what your students are um, facing at home. Um, since students are home and parents could possibly also be at home, uh, there's, there's a lot happening. There could be distractions, there could be little siblings that need to be watched. And so kind of keep that in mind when you're designing um, your curriculum and then thinking about how you're gonna present that to your student. Um, in addition to that, that also plays into the number of devices. So as you're considering how you're going to deliver your content and the methods that your students need to access some of that content, um, keep in mind that there may be a particular device at home that's not compatible with some programs or students are sharing devices and, and how that might affect their ability to access uh, the content that you do deliver to them. Uh, as we've mentioned, sticking with the familiar is going to uh, greatly um, make this transition easier for your students. So um, if you were using a particular tool or platform in your classroom, even if it was just to post assignments or have your students check for updates um, at home, I would recommend that you use that as your starting point. For example, uh, when I taught high school, we had a uh, Google Classroom. And so it was very familiar for me to post um, maybe the assignment that was for homework or upload worksheets. Um, so if I were facing this in my classroom now, I think that's where I would want to start um, since my students would be familiar with that. Um, another way that a secondary teacher could potentially um, deliver some content is even through creating um, maybe a Google slide or a PowerPoint that could be um, emailed out and uh, just outlining maybe the simple tasks that you would like your students to accomplish for you. And um, I think if keeping the um, sites or the, the tabs that students need to go to kind of in one place and, and maybe even minimizing how many um, outside sources they need to utilize, um, I think the, the easier that we can present the content for our students and help them uh, navigate and get through that um, will definitely help them be able to um, complete the tasks that we would like them to, to do. All right, thank you so much. Um, Emily, do you have something to add? I do. Um, thinking about my own classroom and my own kids, I think about checklists and lists for myself. I make lists all the time. I have... Um, it gives me a sense of gratification, but as a teacher as well, we would have lists. These are the things that need to be get done. And so in thinking about delivering content, think about it offering a checklist for your kiddos. 
thinking about, okay, you need to do X, Y, and Z today. And then just a short, remember, we want to keep it simple. This is, this is what you need to accomplish. This is what you need to accomplish. We do that for my, um, my own sons. They have a weekly or a daily checklist that they have to go through. And we include things like brush your teeth and getting dressed and breakfast and all that kind of stuff. And they know that once their checklist is complete, then they can choose what they would like to do. What else, um, something else I like about checklists is that I like to go in order, but you don't have to. So there's an opportunity for choice for your kids. So if you have four items on the checklist, if they don't build on each other, they could start with item number two and then they could choose from there what they wanted to do next. Um, another suggestion I would have is when it comes to content and practice, really leveraging offline activities as well. Um, you know, on my, on my students checklist, read two books that's going to be on there. That's not an online thing. That's an offline thing. I want to continue them to work on their, um, writing, not typing on a computer, but their pencil grip and their coloring. And so offline activities would include drawing and writing letters and making lists and thinking about, um, really encouraging them to do those offline because um, activities just because we want to keep building those skills that we already started doing in the classroom. Thank you so much. That, that, that's, that's good stuff right there. So again, I'm hearing, um, try to keep things familiar, right? Um, and, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, try not to overburden students um, and, and teachers as yourselves to um, Try not to overburden by learning new things that, that just complicate the process. If there are familiar ways to do it, take advantage of that. Um, then also considering time frame and pacing in general, and you know other logistical pieces and realities. The number of devices per household. So um, try to keep things again going back to uh, what we talked about earlier about being simple, um, but, but being very strategic and targeted. Okay, so let's go one step further. Emily, could, could you go, go a little bit further for us and, and take us a little bit down the road and share some ideas about where teachers can find some good content that will help them shift to remote or virtual teaching? Absolutely. Um, so my kids were sent home with some packets of work. So I'm going to utilize that and have them do some paper pencil work. There is no shame in that. Um, it, it keeps up our skills. And I think if you can offer that, and some of you might have to offer that with students with limited access to um, the internet and things like that. So we might have to do some worksheets and things like that. And that is a-okay. So I, wanna, I want to honor some of those offline activities and, and, and say that they're, they're necessary sometimes, right? Um, in terms of online content, some of the tools that I've used with my kids include Teacher Monster to Read. So they all have um, an account and they can, based on, I, I start them at a certain place depending on their level of reading and it kind of progresses through lessons with them. So, and the kids really like it because there's an avatar and they get to change their avatar. But I had started that in the classroom. And so this is not something new I'm introducing to my kids. It's something that's already being done and we're just extending at home. Another platform that I really like is Prodigy and that is for math. And they do a pre-assessment and then they keep moving through standards. And if they, I have a kindergartner who's working on first grade standards now because he has mastered those um, kindergarten math standards and they get to play games and there's an avatar. Everything has an avatar now. Um, so those are two tools that I, I leverage. And I think I've already said Seesaw is a really great place I can put in if I want them to watch a YouTube video. Let's talk about a science unit and we're talking about um, living and non-living things. I found a great YouTube video or brain pop and I can just plug it in there, grab that link and put it into our platform. Um, so those are some of the, the resources that I use frequently with my kids. At the elementary level, we have more in a second, but I want everybody to be able to share some of their, their resources. Yeah, uh, Emily, I'd like to share a little bit about some that are uh, maybe available to a uh, secondary focus a little bit more. Um, my own kids use Khan Academy quite a bit. Anytime they are struggling with something, especially with math, and I cannot help them, I direct them to Khan Academy and they get you know step-by-step -step walkthroughs. Um, I know College Board also uses Khan Academy for 
um, some SAT prep. And, and so there's a lot of options there. And it's really, um, you can kind of like test and see what you need to do. Uh, it's interactive in that way. Um, and then you get the uh, lessons or um, the next like module or, or set of lessons based on what you need. So it's a really great tool in that way and has saved my, my students um, in, in, with their math skills and it's saved me in my relationship with my kids so they can work on it without my help because I'm not very helpful there. But um, Newzella is another one I used to love to use in the classroom, especially because you can adjust for your students' uh, Lexile score, so their reading level, and give them the same uh, current event news source at a different reading level. So that's super helpful if you're starting to direct students to content online. Um, Go Open with Go Open Michigan is an awesome, awesome place where people submit and share all kinds of tools and resources and lessons. So there's a lot of opportunity there as well. And then uh, Michigan Virtual, we have um, added all of the content from the courses that our instructional designers have created onto michiganvirtual.org, which you can access the learning continuity um, site through there. And you'll find all of the packages of content right there for your students. And um, most of them have, you know, interactive pieces and, and formative assessments in that way as well. Just quick little checks to see that students are learning and remembering the material and engaging with that content, but there's over 70 classes available. So um, those are no cost and really helpful if you're looking to just put some content into a platform that you have, like maybe Google Classroom. You can do that right there. So that's fantastic. Um, I know there's probably also an, a feeling like we, we talked about Zoom that you could just start your Zoom uh, meeting and then teach your students in that way. And um, that's possible with some maybe short lessons in small groups like Emily mentioned earlier, uh, but certainly don't feel like you need to be standing in front of a camera and teaching your class in a Zoom meeting. It's not very effective and um, it can be very difficult to manage. And there are so many resources out there that are already developed. So you have that relief and, and can take that off of your shoulders. And that kids can continue to go back if they need the extra help. Um, if you wanna create a short video to share a lesson, that's probably more effective because kids can backtrack to what they missed and, and replay versus you delivering it all in a, a Zoom meeting. Something to think about. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. So my uh, my own children were online learners, and um, and to your point, Andrea, um, I really appreciated having all of those math lessons available to me too as a parent. Um, that kind of helped me help my kids. So uh, <laughs> we have uh, we talked about some of these um, resources that you see on the screen already, um, but um, Emily, Ann, or Andrea, are there any others that you wanted to highlight at this time? Point out a little bit. I um, didn't mention ReadWorks. I use that with some of my older students when I um, was a reading teacher. And so ReadWorks works similarly to Newzella, but you can go in and find a topic at a certain reading level and they have vocabulary and comprehension questions to support that and they are digital. So you can assign students even within that, um, within the program and it will show up you don't have to assign all of your students the same text. You can differentiate. So that's really great. Raz Kids, my own kids use Raz Kids, um, reading A to Z. It is free right now. And they progress through at their own reading level. So uh, one kid reading early in the alphabet and the other kid reading later in the alphabet. So they're kind of progressing lots of different interactive books and books that will be read to them and songs and poems. So that's a really good resource. I already mentioned Prodigy and then IXL offers math um, resources and you don't have to have a login or anything like that. And you can choose what grade level um, and share specific games and things like that to, to further their math skills. I don't know if Anna or Andrew wants to talk about the secondary ones. We've already mentioned some of them. Yeah, I think we, uh, I think we cover those pretty, pretty well already. That's excellent. This is, these are great resources. Thank you for pulling these together for everybody. 
certainly appreciate it. Okay, so we talked about communication and how that's different and how, how, it, how important it is. Uh, we also talked a little bit about content, um, how to deliver it, where to find it. But let's go a little bit deeper now. Let's talk about some, some things about relationships. Andrea, could you share your perspective on the development of relationships in, in remote learning environments? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's an important place to um, pay attention to because you know that your students learn more from you when they have a relationship with you. And we found even with our teachers who teach fully online and our students who are fully online, they do build meaningful relationships without having ever seen each other. So if you're transitioning to the remote setting, you have that base already because you know your kids, um, you've met them in the classroom, and now you're, you're continuing that relationship online. For secondary students especially, they're used to communicating with each other through social media and those types of platforms, um, and they're likely to reveal a lot to you from the um, safety or privacy of a computer. So um, something to think about preparing yourself for, they'll, they'll share a lot online um, with you uh, through that setting. So um, it's still important to do those live check-ins. This is where Zoom and, and Google Hangouts are, are awesome tools because it does give you that chance to really see your student, to let them see and hear you, and that's still important. So. Um, if it's a checking in with your students, just seeing how they're doing, you can use a lot of tools to, to do that, the video conferencing tools. You can also use tools to schedule those meetings, which can be really, really nice. So Calendly is one that's awesome for scheduling meetings and um, it puts it right onto your, your own calendar. So that's super helpful. Um, you also want to think about uh, discussions and how you can handle discussions in the online setting. So there are plenty of tools available for that as well. If you're already using a Google Classroom as your platform, you can create discussions right there in the platform. So you can post a question or a poll and kind of get a read for how students are doing, check in with them and see what's on their mind. Um, it should be you know, there's plenty of opportunity for academic discussion, but there's also opportunity for non-academic um, connection. And, and that's important in keeping that relationship with your students. So um, think about, you know, posing a question like, what'd you eat for breakfast today? Or what's been the best part about your day? Get to continue to get to know them in the remote setting as well. Um, it's also important to build that community between students. So giving them a chance through you know, a discussion board tool like Padlet maybe, um, they can post things and see what their friends are posting as well, um, all right there from within your classroom setting in the online environment. So there's plenty of opportunity to still build relationships. Um, and it's pretty silly, but we have uh, sprinkled these Bitmojis throughout this presentation. And, you know, it's kind of funny that our students find that you know, that's another way to see their teacher, even though it's not their your actual picture, they get a kick out of Bitmojis. You can leave them on feedback. Um, you can put them into your classroom announcements. They just find them pretty humorous and they'll notice if you change your hairstyle or update your clothes for the spring. So it's just kind of another way for them to like connect with you and get that feeling that they have a relationship with you, which is so important, both face-to-face -face and online. Any tools or ideas from uh, maybe an elementary or lower, lower level focus? Andrea, I love you mentioned that the haircut because um, when we were preparing this, I still had a winter wardrobe and was told that I had to update that. So I had to go in and change. Um, but yes, the, the the little kids love these bitmojis too because their teachers are cartoons and they just dig it. So that's that's um, pretty pretty fun. Um, I think for the little kids, I think anytime you can utilize video is really helpful to either communicate or or um, to to do two way or just one way communication. Again, we have kind of limited reading and typing skills, and so utilizing other voice and video technology is really helpful. One really fun um, tool is Flipgrid. And so what you can do is pose a question for your kids. And like Andrea said, 
yes, we want the academic, but the non-academic is just as important building those relationships online. And so you can post a video of yourself, maybe asking a question and then kids can respond with their own video and then they can put stickers on it and add avatars, right? We love avatars. Um, but they can, they can personalize it a little bit. And then you have the option as the teacher, if you want it to be a private or if you want to share it all around. I know one of my kiddos teachers um, for St. Patrick's Day, she encouraged them to build their own um, leprechaun trap. And so then you would send her the video or the, the picture, and then she would share it out with everybody on the class tag platform. And so there was a little bit of a filter there, but still building that community. And um, my son could see what his friends were doing and that also encouraged him to do more work. So that's awesome. Um, but yeah, I think anytime you can, you can utilize video and audio technology for, for our littles is, is, is really, really helpful for them. That's some really great stuff right there. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, you know, I'm still feeling like it's all coming back to creating that familiarity, right? And, and giving the kids the, the taste of live check-ins and, and some, some videos to personalize the experience for the kids. And, you know, um, Andrew, you were talking about, um, you know, teacher to student relationships, but then also student to student relationships. So this is a place, this is a time when as a teacher, you can go ahead and like be an architect of this whole experience for kids. And it's the little things that matter, right? That's what I'm hearing coming across in what you're saying. So, so pulling those pieces together in, in a very meaningful and thoughtful way can make all the difference in the world. Okay. So the, the, real, the relationship aspect we know is huge. It's so important, Not, no doubt about that. Um, but we do also need to talk about another important piece and that's assessments, right? Because that's, that's how we're going to know whether or not we are effective in what we're trying to do for kids and that's help them learn. So we, we do know that assessments in the face-to-face -face environment compared to a remote or virtual learning environment, they're very different. Right. So, Anne, could you help us um, understand this a little bit better? Could you could you talk to us about how how we can assess students and what do we need to be thinking about here? Sure, Chris, I know this is like the ultimate question, or at least when I was in the classroom, anytime there was a disruption in the schedule or even a snow day, my immediate thought was, OK, how is this affecting my assessment that I've planned? And so um, I think the best advice that I can give right now is to design with some flexibility and to kind of think out of the box a little bit. Um, there's definitely great tools that perhaps you were already using that you could still um, try to use um, through uh, something like Google Forms or even creating uh, a quiz on quizzes where you could get some instant feedback for how your students are doing and learning content. But as far as those assessments where you're really trying to see um, you know, how your students are understanding all of the content or how they've progressed through a lesson, um, a suggestion I have might be taking an assignment that perhaps you did or a, a project that maybe was kind of designed to be more collaborative and you know, in class and over a couple of days, think about how you could simplify that, pull out uh, the necessary steps and the pieces that allow students to learn the content um, and then begin to demonstrate how they have learned that and, and their understanding of that. And that demonstration could be also through a couple different ways. I think at least at the secondary level, um, offering some choice in that demonstration might also be a great use of uh, how to assess them. For example, you could have your students um, create a video, as we have talked about before, like explaining their understanding of a concept or showing what they've made. Um, they could definitely um, make a podcast. Some students are really into that and might appreciate that, that uh, choice and demonstration. Um, but I think we, we want to keep in mind, again, that um, students, um, although with our instruction and with our guidance and as much support as possible, are going to be learning um, on their own. And I think if we can leverage some of that personalized learning where we're um, driving with their strengths and giving them some of that choice to really show us what they've learned, I think we'll uh, gather a, a bunch of data that perhaps we, we wouldn't, if 
if we were using our normal assessment, um, critical thinking and, you know, their creativity, their ability to follow those directions. Even if they email you a bunch of questions, you'll see that they're truly trying to tackle that project. So um, I think those are great places to start. And um, I uh, think if Emily wants to chime in or Andrea with some additional tips for how our students could show their learning, that'd be great. Sure, so I feel like a broken record, but coming back to using video and audio again, and not just to deliver, but also to collect information about your students. I've done a running record using a video of a student reading at home, and I was able to, um, the, qu the quality was good. I will, I will admit the, the parent was a teacher, so that was helpful, so they knew what I needed to see, but, um, I've done running records where I can listen to kids read and I see, oh, we need to, uh, you know, adjust the consonant vowel consonant words again, or that sneaky E. So utilizing that to help inform how you might direct your students is a really great way. And you might even find you learn additional things about your kiddos that you might not have known. Thinking about, um, some quiz features, if you want to do just a, a multiple choice, we want to make sure that it's it's accessible for our kids. So thinking about um, those tools that really utilize pictures along with words is probably important. Quizzes has really good feature and Ann already mentioned um, quizzes as well as Google Forms. They have a, the ability to insert pictures now. So that's really nice. But really thinking about um, having students submit work either a photo or a video, so you can give feedback that way. And then if it also has to filter through a parent, you know, the parent can take it with their phone. And if you use like a Remind app, they can send it to you through the Remind app and you can give feedback that way. So um, like I said, just kind of focusing on images and, and audio to help learn a little bit more about what your students know. I know we talked a little bit already about um, flexibility uh, with your remote classroom and remote teaching. And that's really important, I think, for assessments as well. Um, your students are not going to probably be working all at the same time in, this, in the same line, right? So it, it's not synchronous anymore, it's asynchronous. They're working at any time at, at any pace. And so um, thinking about designing your assessments so that kids can access them at different times is important. Um, and, and knowing that you need to be flexible, I, I know Ian talked about this earlier, but be flexible about, um, you know, hard due dates or anything like that, because kids aren't going to be able to submit when you expect them to submit their work. Um, they're sharing devices at home, like we've talked about, and, and so it's important to really uh, apply flexibility here for your assessments as well. And just, uh, Andrea, you just got me thinking about a blog that I was reading yesterday. Um, it was from Shake Up Learning, and it was this idea about right now, in particular, offering grace over grades. And I just thought that that was a really good uh, mindset to kind of remind all people, even as a parent, as I'm, you know, trying to support my own children with their online learning and wanting them to complete their assignments. Um, this is a different time for them and just we can support them, but, you know, with that flexibility, keep in mind what our students are facing and, and offer a little grace as they're completing their assignments and those assessments. Thank you for sharing that. All three of you um, really appreciate that. Um, the, the, the one thing that, um, that, that I'm feeling if I could recap a little bit. Um, we did share Andrea and Emily, and specifically you shared some, some particular tools. Um, you, you shared um, Google Forms and quizzes um, as, as tools that you can use for assessment. Um, uh, and, and Andrea, you, you talked a little bit more specifically about modifying or simplifying assignments, which you know I, I think you know, that goes along with the uh, grace over grades comment that Anne made. Um, so that's that's wonderful. The um, the other thing that I wanted to point out here that that I noticed and it spurred my thinking. Anne, you mentioned about personalizing, and it made me think about when we move into a virtual learning environment where we're not comfortable or we're used to teaching. It does make us rethink everything that we do, and 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 
you know, so maybe there are some things that we can really scale down and, and get to the core of and assessments are, are that. And when you personalize, like you were talking about, Anne, um, it, it, it increases the, the interest of kids in a lot of ways and it, and it sparks greater engagement. And honestly, in a disruptive environment, like, like where kids are moving um, in you know, rapid transition to remote learning, that can be huge and that can be the hook that actually gets kids and keeps them engaged, um, even despite some of the challenges of now learning in a different kind of environment. So thank you, thank you all three for that. Okay, this has been a great conversation. And honestly, I think if, if we didn't have a time limit here, we could probably go on for another hour or so. Um, but I do wanna wrap up a little bit now. And um, and as a way to do that, I'd like to, to shift um, or, or, or gather some thoughts on um, this shift to teaching in a remote or virtual learning environment. I'd like to highlight some key takeaways at this point. So Andrea, Emily, and Anne, could you please take us there? Sure. I think uh, we've we've heard a lot of, of really starting with what you know and what you're familiar with and what your students and families are familiar with. Um, that as kind of your, your ground level and then using that to, to build and bring in other things but really starting with whatever routines are already in place, what your kids are used to, what your parents are used to, what you're used to, and then using that to, to start this transition is a really good starting point. In addition to that, um, I know we've uh, just about through every topic have been talking about the need for flexibility. And so whether it is how you're going to deliver your content, where you're going to find it, how you're going to assess that information, design with flexibility in mind, not only to support your students, but as Emily mentioned, to, to be kind to yourself. Um, you know, you're now in a, in a virtual teaching environment, which could be very new to you. And so the more flexibility we allow for ourselves and our students, I think we will be able to um, make this a very positive experience. And consider the needs for communication when communicating with um, all the stakeholders. Uh, make sure you know your district's expectations and be aware of frequency and volume of communication, as well as um, fitting in the tool to meet the purpose that you're, you're, you have when communicating. Uh, also take this time to use this as an opportunity to build relationships with your students and, and carry on that relationship building. Um, I love what Ann said about grace over grades, and you should also extend that to yourself because you're learning in a new environment as well. Um, let the students see you as a learner and give yourself that grace as well. Thank you all so much. And, and on behalf of, of all of our viewers of this recording, um, thank you for taking the time to, to share some of your thoughts and experiences and your expertise. Uh, I know you're extremely busy, especially during this particular time. Um, so it's, it's greatly appreciated. And I think, you, um, I think you're doing a great service to, to helping people move forward in this time. So thank you. Okay, so um, as we end this session, I just wanna point out once again, the learning continuity resources that we have available to all schools. So uh, by going to the, the web address, michiganvirtual.org slash learning dash continuity, you can see some of the resources here. There's, there's far too many that I could even list on this screen, but I do wanna point out that there are some continu learning continuity and teaching continuity readiness rubrics for school leaders and for teachers in helping to shift and um, kind of points out some things that you need to be looking for as you make this shift. Um, but as Andrea also said, we do have digital content available. Michigan Virtual has made some content available for free for schools to use. Um, and it's not only content for students, but it's also we have some for teachers. So there's professional learning content available. And of course, this webinar series, uh, we, have, we have several webinars, there's more coming. Um, so you can go to the Learning Continuity webpage and, and access all of those. Uh, we also have a Facebook page. This is a great place to go um, to have some, some more frequent interactions with some educators across the state of Michigan and even beyond. The, um, it's a great place for teachers and administrators to share ideas, ask questions, share resources. Um, so you can go to Michigan Virtual's website and you can, um, you can access the webpage from there. 
And we also have a, a learning continuity, a document that is available. It's, um, it's planning considerations for school leaders. It talks about all facets of a school system and things you need to think about and consider as you're making this shift. So um, go ahead and take a look at that uh, at your convenience. So we'd love to continue the conversation with you. Um, unfortunately, um, we're out of time for today, but simply uh, reach out to me. Again, I'm Chris Harrington, and my email address is charrington at michiganvirtual.org. You can reach out to me for anything. Um, we can talk about this webinar. We can talk about other things that might help you move forward. Um, you can also reach me through Twitter or Michigan Virtual uh, through Twitter, and um, those IDs are listed on the screen there. So thanks so much for spending some time with us. We hope it was helpful. If there's anything we can do for you, just reach out. Thanks so much. Take care.